Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Alex Saunders. I am a member of the communication committee here on the Colorado Field Ornithologists. And tonight I'd like to welcome Dr. Laura Trui, uh, the VP of Science Engagement and Visualization at Alder Planetarium in Chicago and the co-principal in investigator of Zooniverse. And if you don't know anything about Zooniverse, we're going to learn a lot about it tonight, but it's a community um, science platform. And projects range from Civil War, transcribing Civil War documents to identifying spider crabs on underwater time lapse images. So there's literally something for everybody. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Trui. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And throughout this talk, uh, given the size of the group, really don't hesitate to uh, uh, just uh, uh, post your questions or interrupt because it's much more fun if it's a discussion and I was thinking about how best to engage tonight and so there's even a sort of participatory section uh, staying true to our people-powered research approach to things um, so I'm going to share my screen let's see so let me know if you see that okay um, so first I'm, I'm Laura uh, uh, and um, as the Vice President of Science Engagement at the Adler Planetarium, I get this luck of doing all sorts of science engagement with the public in person, but then our flagship online program is the Zooniverse. Um, and my background is astronomy, but my day is spent talking with ecologists and cancer researchers, climate scientists, uh, folks in the humanities, who are looking for how do they unlock really large data sets and taking advantage of these tools we now have for uh, engaging the crowd in them. Um, my uh, part of why I was excited about talking with you all tonight is one of my best winters was spent in uh, Boulder, Colorado, working at the Southwest Research Institute um, as an undergrad. And at that time, I got to study Titan, one of Saturn's moons, with some amazing group of researchers there. And, uh, and since then, have returned to Colorado over time, um, later when I was studying supermassive black holes and galaxy evolution, because there's this amazing astronomy group. But the nature in Colorado is so special. And so I can see why you all uh, have this common interest around um, birding and being out in nature. Um, so Zooniverse, as was mentioned, it's the largest platform for online, we call it people-powered research or citizen science. Um, we have over 100 active projects right now, uh, 2.5 million, we just hit the milestone of 2.5 million people uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and people come from all over the world uh, to participate in these projects. It's kindergartners to senior citizens and everyone in between, because uh, you don't need any special background or expertise. And it's about unlocking data to help researchers, whether it's discovering planets around distant stars, to marking cell structures for cancer research, to transcribing old historic documents. Um, and I'll show some examples. Um, there's also a neat parallel in the origin story so Zooniverse started as a partnership between the Adler Planetarium, a science museum uh, with all the expertise and engage in public and science and the University of Oxford. And if I've understood, I was looking through the Colorado field ornithologist history and you have a, a founding um, that was related to the Denver Museum of Natural History. And so the role of cultural institutions or science museums and how uh, they can kick off these abilities for the community or for the public to engage in, in uh, pursuits that are related to science uh, is a really meaningful piece of what we do um, for society. So to understand the why of Zooniverse, so why, why we started it back in 2007, uh, it helps to know so the origin story. So back in 2007, there was this group of astronomers who had a million galaxy data set and uh, they quickly realized that it would take more than their professional lifetimes just to classify these galaxies, let alone pursue the research questions of interest. Um, there, there was a grad student in the, in the small group of astronomers working with this data set who spent a month classifying galaxies, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and everything in between, and he classified 50,000 galaxies. That was just a drop in the bucket of the million galaxy data set. Um, at the time, Angry Birds, if you have ever played that game, Angry Birds was really popular 
And so this team, which was a mix based at the Adler Planetarium, all the science engagement we do, and at the University of Oxford, they wondered, could we harness the power of the crowd to do this really basic pattern matching task of is this spiral, is this elliptical, um, and could we get the quality of data we need? And so they launched the, uh, the Galaxy Zoo project back in 2007, really simple interface. Within the first hours, they were getting 50,000 classifications an hour. And in the first year, 150,000 people participated, provided millions of classifications for these galaxy images. And the research team within a year, rather than 35 years, had this whole data set unlocked. And then since then we've published over 40, 45 different research publications on this data set of how galaxies change over time. And so it was this real important proof of concept um, that this could work, that the public would want to get involved, and that they could get quality data that could then be used for real research. So once word of Galaxy Zoo spread across different research fields, um, a few researchers with large data sets approached this team that had a mix of web developers and researchers and public engagement um, experts at the Adler and at Oxford. And so one of these early uh, teams was Snapshot Serengeti. So this was tagging animals and behaviors and camera trap images from across the Serengeti desert. Um, a few helpful media boosts in the first weekend meant they got 3 million classifications that first weekend and retired a backlog of 18 months of data. Um, so it was also became this proof of concept of how quickly you could uh, process data with engaging the public. Um, Snapshot Serengeti was also an important project for us as a team to further refine our data quality process and reliability processes. So with all Zooniverse projects, each image is classified by multiple people. Um, in Galaxy Zoo, it's 45 people per image. Snapshot Serengeti, it was 25 people. And it was set by like what quality of data they needed and how quickly you could get it um, based on sort of average classifications. So we, for every project, the team uploads a set of, of around a thousand images typically that have been classified by experts. And then they compare it with the crowd consensus result. And so, for example, if like 24 out of 25 of the public participants say, yeah, there's an, uh, there's an elephant here and it looks to be walking, um, you can be confident in that result. And then you also compare it to the expert classification that says, yes, there's an elephant here and it's walking. And that gives you a sense for the reliability from the crowd. So 97% of the time in a typical project that, or in Snapshot Serengeti, the crowd uh, consensus result agrees with the experts. And in the 3% of the time when they don't, it's typically the images of an animal way off in the distance. And even the experts can't agree amongst themselves. All you can see is the butt or the tail. You're like, I'm not sure between these five different species what it is. Um, right now, there are over 20 different of these camera trap style projects on Zooniverse. And I'll, I'll show a few different ones um, later in the talk. But some are in nature reserves, a number are in urban centers, um, and, and a whole mix of different animal and uh, predator-prey relationships that we're trying to understand, impact of climate change, etc. So then to keep giving a sense for the variety of project types, the Milky Way project is one of our um, over two dozen astronomy projects on Zooniverse. And here it's also showing not only do we do tagging of images, like is it a elliptical galaxy or is that an elephant in the image? But we also have a number of projects that do drawing tasks. So here you're looking for star forming regions and the bubbles and the shocks. And, um, and then uh, the next slide shows the aggregation process. So in Milky Way projects, there are, I think in this project, it's 55 people classify every image. Here you can see on the top image, all 55 of the different circles <laughs> that um, these different participants for this image have drawn. And then the bottom half of the image shows uh, when you use really sophisticated aggregation routines that weight the different, um, the different drawing, the markings, but also we've started to take into account our knowledge of user skill. So we, we track participants and how well they do against expert classifications over time and different metrics that we follow. And then we can weight different users in different ways and we create a consensus result. And, um, and then do a vetting process for a subset of the data and get a sense for quality and reliability. 
So another uh, way we've applied the same model and the same approach, but for uh, humanities is all the transcription projects we have on the site. Let's see if this play. Yeah. So um, so here is uh, one of my favorite projects. It's called Anti-Slavery Manuscripts, and it was William Lloyd Garrison and his group of abolitionists and their handwritten letters to one another. Um, and so here, this little screen um, video capture just shows the process of the transcribing line by line of these handwritten um, texts. And we're currently uh, working with the University of Minnesota and some machine learning experts for how to integrate uh, autom automatic handwritten technology recognition, so automatic transcription, um, and give that as an option for participants to look at, or they give their own transcription, or they look at a previous human transcription and edit it. And so there's a whole level of sort of trying to use software in our uh, web infrastructure in sophisticated ways to make the project as efficient. Um, so we best utilize people's time with this integration of machine learning and human effort. And right now there's um, uh, over 15 different um, transcription projects on the, on the site. And, and then one other uh, example, just in this initial kind of run through of different project types. Um, so when we're thinking about how do we take these tools that we're using for research, um, whether it's you know cancer research, climate science, astronomy, um, but then we were seeing the impact of these incredible uh, devastating natural disasters. And we were thinking about, well, we have this way of efficiently processing data. And we know that humanitarian aid organizations on their ground after a hurricane hits, for example, they're trying to efficiently deploy resources. And so we created this partnership with the Rescue Global Humanitarian Aid Organization and uh, uh, satellite um, imagery to be able to create, um, take pre and post images after a natural disaster and have the public um, mark road blockages, uh, settlements, structural damage, different elements that Rescue Global really wanted to know about and know as quickly about as possible. And, uh, and so, for example, and just when um, Hurricane Dorian was going through the Caribbean um, a few years ago, in just uh, a week, our 10,000 of our Zooniverse participants worked on Planetary um, Response Network project and did the equivalent of about two years of full-time effort, just jammed into six days. And, and even within the first two days, we had the bulk of the, the main images that we wanted to, to process. And so that just meant Rescue Global could more quickly um, go to the places they needed to go to and deploy resources where they most wanted to. Um, so, uh, so I've talked mostly, or while well, all the projects are set up to be a browser-based experience, um, you know, on your iPad or laptop or com desktop to computer. Um, we've also created a mobile app that optimizes the experience for a few specific tasks. And so, oh, let's see, here's the video of just the navigation interface within the mobile app. And then a stellar uh, sea lion project where if you swipe left for no, swipe right for yes, is there a sea lion present or not? And so it was partly came out uh, some having drinks with the team and thinking, wouldn't it be funny to do a Tinder Zooniverse? And then out of that conversation came a really efficient way to classify data, quick swipe left or right for yes or no. Um, and so there's a number of projects that are on the mobile app. And I found that even for me, but also just anecdotally, a lot of people do this on their commute, where it's just a really relaxing, calming, um, just a quick classification and feeling like you're, you're using your time well, but also having kind of a quiet moment of looking at pretty images and making a quick yes, no answer. Um, okay, so uh, yes, great. So it's, it's uh, 20 after. I wanted to take some time because this is a nice sized group. And it's really fun just to get to do something rather than just listen to someone talk. So we are going to have a little fun and do some science together because each of you are on your own computers. And so, uh, and I chose the Penguin Watch project because, well, I love these images and there's an overlap with uh, birding uh, interests. So um, 
Penguin Watch, first I'll give a quick rundown of the project, and then I'll go to the site itself. I'll share my screen, but I will invite you all to go to penguinwatch.org with me and we'll classify uh, some images um, in parallel and then just have a little fun with it. So first, a little about the research. So Penguin Watch is a project where you mark the location of adults versus chicks versus eggs. Um, you're contributing to real research um, that's ongoing. It's been going for about um, eight years now. Um, and uh, so if you go to penguinwatch.org and click on the about page, which I can do in a moment, but here I've just pulled out kind of the key, the guts of the why of their research. Um, so this is a University of Oxford based team of penguinologists. Um, they collect drone images every year across a few specific sites around Antarctica. They've uploaded hundreds of thousands of images into their Zooniverse project and each year, each season, they welcome the public's help to process these data. Um, it launched in 2013, and since then, tens of thousands of people have contributed millions of classifications. Um, the research team's main goal is to understand breeding success, chick survival, and how environmental conditions change the timing and outcomes of those um, different key parameters. A few years ago, the Penguin Watch team presented the results from the, the from this crowdsourcing effort to government agencies and um, and also they were working alongside environmentalists and climate change researchers and it was a whole group effort to bring all the different data pieces uh, the the different uh, teams had brought together and then they presented it to these uh, the government agencies and what they were able to do was extend the marine protected area around the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands, which are just north of Antarctica. Um, and they're continuing to work really closely with the government in those regions to set commercial fishing policies um, and, and as well as using the data for climate change studies. And as you know, and uh, it's it's always this balance between um, understanding the impact on the flora and fauna and then also understanding the human uh, needs in the area. And so it's just trying to set really smart fishing policies that provide sustainability. Um, Penguin Watch has published over 10 peer-reviewed science publications um, and recently just another one came out um, on the efforts from this project. Okay, so now you have a sense for just the Penguin Watch's goals and impact. So let's classify a little bit together. Okay, so please take a moment and go to penguinwatch.org. I will do the same. Okay, so penguinwatch.org. And maybe if one of you wants to uh, post that URL into the chat, that can be an easy copy and paste for other people. Okay, so do you see, now you see the Penguin Watch project? Yes, okay. So here's the Penguin Watch project. And, um, and so if you're on this landing page, I mentioned in the about pages, it talks about the research and the team that's working on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're just at the landing page, uh, scroll down and you can click on time-lapse cameras. So this is the workflow we'll participate in and we'll take you know five minutes and do this together. So you can keep listening to me, but also just go ahead and start classifying. Um, you don't have to be signed in. You can see that I happen to be signed in. Um, you can do this without registering right now, or if you want to, um, if up in the upper right, there's a register button, all it asks for is your email address, but truly don't feel that you have to register. You can just participate. In the long term, if you do register, then you can track your personal stats. Um, which is kind of fun to see how many classifications you've done, but you don't have to. The idea when we built Zooniverse is lowest barrier to entry possible, make it as simple as possible for all ages, all backgrounds to participate. Um, so here's just an example of one of the many drone images that are uploaded to the project. There's a tutorial and the tutorial steps you through um, like, it does for any Zooniverse project, the really simple task request. So here it's about marking adults, chicks, eggs, and other seabirds or vehicles or humans um, that might show up in the images. This next slide says that if there are 
uh, animals, penguins that are in the background, and there are a lot of them, and they're blurry or hard to count um, as individuals, then you don't need to uh, click on any of those. You can focus on the foreground penguins. And if there are any images that are blurred out from rain or moisture, um, there's a little, uh, this image is too dark or blurry button that you can click and it shortcuts to the end. Um, and this is if there are other non-penguins and marking them. All right, let's go. I'll do some example uh, ones and I'll show a little bit about the interface. Um, and I'm seeing, okay, so we'll keep going for like five minutes, I think. So here I am looking for the adults. So I'm just clicking, oh, I think. So here I have to think, oh, is that an adult or is that a chick? So I can go to the field guide and I actually don't, you know, like many of us, I don't know all the different penguin types, but I'm just gonna take a look in general and, and see, oh, adults tend to be like the black and white, chicks tend to have kind of fuzzier feathers and are brown or gray. So you can go through the different penguin types and see the difference between adults and chicks. And then you don't have to be too worried about getting it wrong because in Penguin Watch, 24 other people are gonna classify this image. And they also have machine learning algorithms that are being trained and learning from the classifications that, um, that we as humans are providing. And so you can also, now I want to zoom in because I'm trying to see, are these just dirty or are these the more of the chicks? So I'm going to say that I think these are chicks, but if anybody on this call, for example, is more of a penguin expert, definitely shout out and be like, no, those aren't chicks. Um, so keep going. You know what? I, I'm going to say I've had enough here. So the next question is, have you marked all the animals? It's totally okay if you only have marked a subset um, because you have so many people marking every image that they take all that data and aggregate them together. I'm gonna say there were too many for me to count on that one and click done. It kind of, sometimes it's really like you get in a groove and you do all of them in an image. And sometimes you think, you know what? I'm just gonna do the subset and then move on to the next image. I'm gonna check the chat and see how people are doing. All right, so actually just to get a sense for whether folks are into this, uh, whether one of the other mod moderator hosts wants to speak up or anybody on the call, is this a, okay, somebody just posted and said, I could see this getting very addictive. That's a good sign. Should we keep going for a few more minutes just to see, give people a chance to keep classifying and I'll, I'll keep sharing my screen while I classify a little bit more. Sure, I think a couple more yeah. minutes would be wonderful, yeah. All right. And I can share some stories along the way. So one of my um, favorite aspects, well, I love so much about this project. One thing that's very cool is each year um, they do a raffle uh, and anyone who's participated in their project that year is entered into the raffle and then they pull a name and they invite that person to go on their expedition to Antarctica. And part of this is their commitment to really continuing to have a real engagement and public perspective into the research they're doing. And then there's a huge communication piece where whoever that participant, that volunteer is who goes on the expedition, they write blog posts and take images. And there's a ton of communications to the rest of the community that they do for that week. Um, and so if you're signed in and you're participating, that means your name is now entered into the raffle and uh, you are, uh, you have a potential for traveling to Antarctica um, with the team. And what they do is they, they have these set of drones. They uh, release the drones to take images across the, um, the different islands and regions that they're interested in, that they're collecting data from each year. And each season they're getting hundreds of thousands or if um, a million or a couple million images. And so they're constantly uploading new images, um, and uh, and just, it's really important, especially through this type of project of having that temporal, like over time ability to gather data, analyze the data, see how things are changing. And between 2013 and now, as you all know, uh, climate change, you start seeing the impact across those years. 
Um, and it also just gives you a baseline for 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and so on. <laughs> um, thank you for the posted comment. Um, there, it is really fun when you see, well, I'll zoom in. So you see these little gray blobs. These are chicks that are hanging out underneath their adult, um, which is always, it's just fascinating to see. Uh, my, my grandmother was an avid birder and just generally a, a naturalist. And I completely understand the fascination and like the very in-depth, um, just really getting into a topic like this. I can see why some really into penguins because they're such charismatic um, creatures. Okay, we'll do one more minute of classifying and, uh, and then I'll, I'll keep talking more about Xenoverse in general, but I think it's such a important to see uh, in detail how a project works, what the experience is like, and I think I've gotten most of everything. <laughs> and now I'm I'm really into this image, so I want to go fully. Um, I don't see any eggs in this particular one, but you can see um, there's quite a number of the nest formations. So penguins bring together these rocks. Um, they push them uh, around these the divots that they create in the ground. Um, first, they they place their eggs in those divots, and then they stick around for quite some time with their chick in that same area before moving on. Okay, so here, yes. And each project has, if I click on talk, and some of you may, may have already done this as you were exploring. So talk is a dedicated discussion forum for every project. We also have a Zooniverse wide talk for um, sort of community questions and building that we do. Um, <laughs> Penguin Watch has a great Fun Facts Friday. Highly recommend checking that out. Um, but if you ever were classifying an image and you saw something that was unusual or weird, or you just wanted to learn more about it, um, actually I should have shown, you can, um, uh, you can click this done and talk and it brings the image into this discussion forum. And then you can have a conversation around the image. And the researchers, part of the, part of, being on the Zooniverse platform is that researchers commit to engaging with their participants. And that's a really key part of the project is that the, the volunteers get something out of it and the researchers are getting something out of it. And a lot of the big discoveries of Zooniverse have happened in these discussion forum spaces. Um, it's also just a fun way to find, you know, fun, neat images of if, for example, you want to see eggs in, in the in an image, you can um, click on the hashtag egg and then come in and see, uh, let's see, there must be an egg hiding down in under this little guy there. I think that must be poking out a little egg. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about, uh, about the discussion forums later in the talk. So that was our little foray into participating directly in a project. For those of you who may have signed in, just so you, uh, you know, if you go to, um, you go in the upper left of the Zooniverse uh, site and you're signed in, that brings you to the home page, which is also your personal stats page. And so you can see how many classifications you've done on different projects over time. And so, um, You'll, you'll have Penguin Watch pop up and it'll say uh, how many classifications you've done, which is a fun way to just see what your personal contributions have been uh, to the site. I'll check the chat. Oh, wonderful. Using Snapshot Serengeti before you went to Kruger National Park. What an amazing experience. Um, yeah, Snapshot Serengeti, I can actually show briefly. Um, Snapshot Safari is a whole set of um, camera trap projects across African wildlife reserves. Right now, the only active one is Wildcam Gorongosa, but Snapshot Serengeti is, is part of this family of projects. They just don't have data right now. Um, but the idea is uh, you have some <laughs> fun, you have some beautiful, interesting image on the left, and then this whole slew of species to choose from on the right. Um, uh, and this one is is neat. It, it's the the background animals that get captured as well as the the foreground animals. 
um, which is so fun. Thank you for sharing and please continue sharing uh, your own experiences, whether it's Zooniverse or other public participation in science projects. Um, I'm always fascinated what's meaningful to people. Um, so before I, I dive into other parts of the platform, I was just gonna quickly show, so if you go to zooniverse.org slash projects, um, it's just our, or click on projects, it's our page that shows all the active projects at every given time. At the top, we always highlight for projects um, of interest that may particularly need people's help right now. Um, Planet Hunters uh, Next Generation is up here because the grad student involved in this project is getting close to when they need to um, uh, present their thesis project. And so they're trying to get a big push on data. So if you have a moment, want to try to find a planet around a distant star, definitely go there. Um, but uh, the, so there's 102 active projects right now. Each project is led by a different research team. So just as like Penguin Watch is led by the penguinologists at University of Oxford, um, uh, each project has a different team leading it. And you can, uh, you can filter the projects by these different subject areas. Um, and so if you click on nature, that brings you to all the different projects uh, that are environmental sustainability, um, animal related projects. Um, and later in the talk, uh, I can go through some specific bird project ones, just in case that might spark some ideas in the team. Um, but first, I was gonna talk a bit about the tools that we've made available so that this, um, just democratizing access to these research tools. Um, before 2015, our the, the web development team that I lead at the Adler, so you know, a group of three to four people um, in partnership with Oxford and a similar size team, we could build three to five of these types of projects each year. And then we got a Google Global Impact Award grant to be able to create a DIY browser-based project builder platform so that anybody could build their own Zooniverse project for free. And the idea was we didn't want it to be limited to, you know, research teams at research institutions who had grant money, who had resources to be able to hire us to do this. Instead, we wanted to make it really simple, really easy, and, and really so that anybody could build their own and then access the Zooniverse crowd of 2 million plus people. So the project builder um, is, uh, just finding my notes. Um, so it, right, in 2015, we built this browser-based interface with simple drag and drop tools. So as you build, you can immediately see what your project looks like. So this is an example of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We have a number of projects with them. This was around their, um, bird cams, the battling birds project. So their interface, just this simple browser-based tool that we created, they would just fill in the text, upload images, upload their data, and then they could immediately see what the public facing site would look like. Um, and this piece, the workflows area was where they set the task. And we really encourage and support teams to create the simplest task possible so that they can um, include the widest um, and most diverse group of backgrounds of volunteers possible in their project. Um, and this was, uh, and then the same, you see the, the interface and then you can immediately see what the public sees from the experience. So this one was uh, looking at different birds present in these webcam video, uh, these short video clips, and then talking about what behavior they saw from these different birds. Um, and so we went from building three to five projects a year with our small web development team to uh, supporting the launch of over 50 different projects every year. So five, zero different projects. And so we really just accelerated the expansion of this universe over time. And I've been working with over 150 different partner institutions, everyone from different universities um, across the US, UK and around the world. Um, but also like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Natural Resources, um, as well as like junior colleges, community colleges, um, research institutions, labs, libraries, museums, um, and everything in between. Um, so I'm seeing 
time it is. And I am very happy to take questions. I can also showcase a few of the, the different um, bird related projects that are currently active. Uh, but first I'll, I'll pause and welcome your questions. And uh, it's really a pleasure just meeting with you all and talking tonight. Now, thank you so much. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please um, enter them into the chat and we'll uh, we'll get Dr. Tui to, uh, to have a stab at them. Uh, but that was very interesting. It was so interesting to see that uh, the the Tinder app. I could see how that could be addictive on your on your train ride into town or your or your bus ride, and and uh, just the way you've made it available to to kind of self start the projects opens it up to so many other um, pro or research projects that wouldn't be able to afford, like you were mentioning, uh, the staff and the time to really build it out uh, on their own. So that's amazing. I agree. Yes. And now that I'm, especially for the project builder, it's mainly through word of mouth and conference presentations and within each field that people hear about this as a tool. And so my request to you all is if you can be ambassadors of this tool, like if you ever come across a researcher or a community organization who has a large data set and they're just spending a lot of their um, their small groups time to classify or analyze it in some way, and you think it might fit the Zooniverse model and you can take advantage of the crowd, uh, please do share, uh, share it, help, help be an ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I saw in the chat, I'm happy to show, okay, so if you're at zooniverse.org slash projects, I bet some of you are already doing this. And one of the things I love when I'm doing, uh, especially like volunteer events, we have a whole corporate volunteering program with the Zooniverse, is that I often see in the calls like, parents and their kids are doing this and I might be talking all sorts of stuff, but they are definitely not <laughs> in a very good way, not paying attention to me, but just clearly like having a fun in one of the projects together. So uh, universe.org slash projects. And then um, Woodpecker Cavity Cam actually is one of the highlighted ones right now. It's a great project um, of a, it's a bird cam um, project where you, you can see a short video clip and then you're asked what type of woodpecker it is. And then there's a series of questions on behavior. Um, but as with all projects, if you click on the about page, you can see the team that's leading this. And so this is um, University of Minnesota has a whole uh, Department of Fisheries Wildlife and um, they spearheaded this uh, not too long ago, the kickoff of this project, but woodpeckers are, are just fascinating to watch. I have a few in my own backyard, so I was excited right. when this project came on. Another one is, oh, I, here's an example. The Wild Southwest, I thought I'd highlight it because of where you all are located in Colorado um, a little bit, uh, and just there's such a, a richness of different species that are captured in camera trap images. So this is a project um, led by an interesting team um, uh, so some based at the University of New Mexico um, and then the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, partnership. And, and so here it's, it's looking at still images from camera traps and then tagging what species. Oh, this is, you couldn't ask for like a more cool image just to happen to come across. That's an it. easy one. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, then there's another example Wild Watch Burrowing Owl is a really cool project led by the San Diego Zoo. And actually, I don't remember where their images are being taken from. Um, I know it's led by the zoo. Oh, I should know this. My apologies. There's with a uh, with hundred different ones. I will, if I don't see it quickly, I will have you take some time and find where the location is. But the images are just really cool of looking at you know, what type of species might be in the image um, and then what type of behavior. So I can, um, if when I click on this, you can see it's not just saying like, it's a burrowing owl that's in there, but you're also saying like, are there prey deliveries present? What type of um, evidence of predation or mortality event? How many adult birds? Are there any young? Um, do you see mating, feeding or infanticide? It, it's just, all sorts of information that the research team is collecting to do deeper analyses about the particular population here. Um, 
The San Diego Zoo has another project they lead called Wild Watch Kenya that's um, based in a Kenyan wildlife reserve. But uh, oh, thank you. Somebody posted. Love it. Burrowing owl photos are from San Diego County. OK, so they're more uh, local in the US. But uh, yeah, San Diego Zoo is doing really interesting work and have used Universe in a few of their different projects, um, which uh, makes me happy that it's being utilized for good impact. I think I briefly may have touched on that, yeah, um, earlier in my talk, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, they had this bird cams, webcams around feeders project. They also have this really cool project called Nest Quest Go. And it's had, I think by now, maybe 60 different iterations. But what it is, is transcribing historical nest records that were, um, that were collected over a hundred plus years um, and are part of their archives. And it was this North American nest record program from the 60s until the early 2000s. It may be that some of you may have um, participated in the, the record card program. And mo all of that data that was um, handwritten, they then have put into this project so that uh, public participants around the world can transcribe and digitize these uh, uh, handwritten records. Um, it's a really lovely project. In general, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology team um, has been fun to work with. Uh, just the group and the personalities in the group, they're such a wonderful, like kind group of people um, and generally gave me the sense that birders uh, are this just a wonderful community, uh, very welcoming and just trying to do good. Um, Penguin Watch has a sister project called Seabird Watch. Um, and this one is around similar, um, similar areas, uh, but, or so through the Arctic um, and, and looking at, uh, with a focus on, on different seabirds. And so here, it's often a question of zooming in and then clicking on the different, um, particular types of seabirds that are present in the images, but a really, just a really interesting data set. It's also kind of one of the reasons I like Penguin Watch and Seabird Watch is the environment around the birds is always really just beautiful. And so part of it is like you're taking travels around the world. Um, you can see me just refreshing the page. <laughs> so it is not a bad thing to go to a Zooniverse project and just skip through images by refreshing the page <laughs> and just seeing seeing the different areas. Um, whatever way uh, that Zooniverse may serve somebody in what they want from it, for us, it's wonderful to get classifications and get you know data unlocked. But we also just encourage people to like have fun with it, to take a moment of calm or you know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hard things happening in our day-to-day -day lives. And if Zooniverse can be a moment of peace for people, we are very happy for it to be used in that way um, and so on. Um, okay. that's, that's such a generous idea too, instead of coming here and thinking, oh, I've, I need to be an expert or, or, or really have it dialed in just to, to sit back and enjoy and do a little bit of aid and and serve yourself as well it's such a great mm -hmm. idea um so we had another that. question in chat oh, yeah. there, laura about um how can project volunteers get information on their accuracy or identifications uh, or are you guys kind of using that behind the scenes only oh you know that's a good question it's something we've debate debated over time Right now, no, you can only, what, what you can see is your classification count. Um, but it is, it is something that different online citizen science or people powered research programs, some of them do provide uh, your average quality over time, but that's, that often seems to have a non, it's not an incentivizing piece of data. So instead, what we've been doing is I, I, some of our projects, not all of them, while you're classifying, you will get feedback that says, oh, you just classified one of the small subset of images that were classified by experts. The expert hmm. thought this is a burrowing owl and it had you know X, Y, Z behavior happening. And you thought, and it kind of reminds you what you submitted. And, and it, it, you know, if you've, 
agreed with the expert, it'll give a little green line. If you disagreed with the expert, it'll highlight it in a different color. Um, but it's it's all about trying, kind of going back to this ethos of like, lower the barrier to entry, know that you don't have to worry too much about your individual classification because it's really the power of the crowd and the crowd gets it right. You can have people who are outliers who get it wrong, but in general, on average, people do hone in on the right answer as a collective. Um, and we just, there's an ongoing desire that people, uh, you know, it's a very low stakes and you don't have to be concerned about the rightness or wrongness but as a human, I totally understand like wanting to know if I've gotten it right or wrong. And so we're trying to find ways to do it that's um, that's very like gentle and then gives people resources through, you know, things like the field guide and other. So that if you get things wrong, the feedback will say, hey, check out the field guide on the burrowing owl. There's some more like details in there that might be useful to you. Um, so great question. And uh, I'd say about a quarter of our projects right now use this feedback functionality. I think, let's see. Oh yeah, just a couple more like bird related <laughs> projects. So where is Spoony is a really fun one about these beautiful um, spoonbills that are, um, uh, yeah, that they're just beautiful images. And the team that leads this project um, oh, I'm forgetting where they're based. Oh, right. This is a, a collaboration between uh, researchers in France and researchers in Portugal and data they've collected. It's it's European based project. Um, but yes, a, a beautiful bird. Um, and then this was Wild Cam Gorongosa. But yeah, I I recommend just play around, take some time at this universe.org slash projects, whether it's bird projects or really anything, uh, you know, if you're into biomedicine on the side as well, or you're wanting to transcribe, um, uh, transcribe historic documents. We just launched the Civil War Blue Jackets project about um, US, uh, Civil War US sailors. And it's just fascinating data across all these. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like you could get lost and there's something for everybody uh, and anybody, any of your interests. And and I, I really appreciate the fact that you've mentioned that it's okay to dabble. You don't need to mm -hmm. come here and spend your weekends doing this um, because even, even with um, people kind of casually doing this, I mean, knocking down the time it would take from 35 years to less than a year I mean that's amazing in the in the scientific gains that we can get from that. That's just fantastic. So yeah, it's maybe helpful knowing the stats is that for people who dabble, you know, just do a few classifications. We get about half of our classifications from those dabblers, yeah. and then half of our classifications from people who get really deeply into it and sort of have it as part of their regular routine and do a few hours every week. Um, but I, I like that, and I, and we want to uphold that ethos of whether you do a couple of classifications or you do tens of thousands of classifications, they're both as valuable because it's about harnessing the crowd as a, yeah. as a whole. Um, yeah, yeah. There's That's also, fun. oh, uh, just, it also made me think about, we have found, because there's this burgeoning in-person, hands-on, environmental um, justice, environmental sustainability type of citizen science projects that are that are happening. Um, there's a wonderful website, uh, Sci. Oh, sorry, Sci. I'm sideways on my keyboard. SciStarter.org. So, um, SciStarter is a great repository of hands-on in-person and online citizen science opportunities. Um, and uh, you can search by local opportunities, especially if you're looking for something that's hand, hands-on in person, like water monitoring in your local area, for example. And what I like is there's this growing community of people who, who go from doing hands-on in-person stuff to doing online stuff, whether it's Universe or eBird or other platforms, and then coming back to do in-person and vice versa. And there's this really rich kind of ecosystem of public participation in science uh, that's happening that um, 
also just encourage you to explore or share with others. Um, and, and sometimes there's an accessibility element to an online citizen science platform. Like if you go from somebody who's very mobile to you know, having a life change and then no longer being as mobile, but still wanting to be engaged with nature, something like Zooniverse can provide ongoing opportunities for you that I think um, just, again, provides community, provides opportunity for continued engagement that uh, we want to nurture. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Trui. I really appreciate you coming here tonight and, and taking the time to speak to us.